Dear friends, Allah Abha, I do hope that you are ready for about 70-75 minutes of talk on the tablet of medicine, one of the uh, mightiest, in fact, works of Baha'u'llah on the topic. But you are facing a wrong speaker because I'm not a physician myself and the tablet of physician probably should have been dealt with by a physician with medical studies, medical background. However, I'm at your service to speak about this tablet probably more from the, as a piece of the writings of Baha'u'llah rather than a medical document and explaining and going into the analytical approach towards the question of medicine and medical sciences. The other thing is that I am medically a failure because for the past six, five, six decades, half a dozen of wonderful physicians have been working on increasing my height. <laughs> and they have not been successful. So, from the medical point of view, I am not qualified because I have never been healed from this problem of being short. So, if you accept a short speaker talking about the question of medicine, this is it. Friends, tablets of, uh, tablet of medicine, as I mentioned, is... Uh, is a tablet in which Baha'u'llah has devoted uh, a few pages in the original Arabic text to the question of, of medicine. We don't know exactly, well, I, I, I really don't know exactly when it was uh, revealed, but definitely is one of the earliest works of Baha'u'llah upon his arrival to the city of Akka and therefore is one of the earliest works of Baha'u'llah in Akka period. And probably, conveniently, we can say that 1872, 73, 71, 1871, 72 is more or less the date of the revelation of this tablet of medicine. The tablet of medicine is, is written or is revealed for a very distinguished Baha'i, a very, very well-versed man in medical, traditional medical Eastern school of medicine by the name Muhammad Reza Manshadi, Tabib. Muhammad Reza Manshadi Tabib. He was from Yazd, and his name is Muhammad Reza, but he never had academic education on the question of medicine, but he was raised, such as many, many, many other physicians of the time, in the traditional school of medicine. And traditional school of medicine in the East is usually based on Muhammad Zakaria Razi's works, and then after him, the works of Ibn Sina in the English literature known as Avicenna. Avicenna probably is one of the greatest mind that human being has ever seen. He is a man of tremendous amount of energy intellectually, interested in philosophy, interested in religion, interested in psychology, interested in medicine, and he has written extensively and is one of the pillars of all sciences, and he is the famous author of canon in medicine. That is his book. And his book was for many, many centuries, all the way to the medieval time, or even at the present time, 
what Avicenna has written about and has thought about the question of medicine has been a very important solid source even for present modern medicine for the students of medical sciences. Particularly during the time of the medieval time, Canon of Avicenna was a major work. And the man, Avicenna, was an authority. Muhammad Rezaia Tabib, who is the recipient of his tablet, comes from this, this school. And he is well versed in this traditional medical school. I have to say a few words that among the Muslims, medicine was important. And there are books on Tebbun Nabi, the medicine of the Prophet. And also they have medical books in Islam, in Islamic civilization, on Tebbul Nabi and Tebbul Imam. And these are the writings of the Muslim students and the disciples of the Prophet and the followers of the Imams that they have heard medical advices, medical suggestions. They observe the life of the Prophet from the medical point of view, from his daily behavior, what he ate, what he told his followers, advised them medically, and they recorded. So there are books which have been inspiring the medical uh, Muslims, med medicine, uh, doctors, and now the books are, of course, are, are available. One of them is Tebbun Nabi, for example. The... Basic issue in this school of medicine has to do, on the one hand, with the science of medicine. At the same time, medicine for Islam and for Islamic doctors has to do with ethics, morality, and at the same time has to do with nutrition. So when we call Islamic medicine, we are not talking about the narrow medical sense that probably we understand today. Medicine in that sense has to do with your moral behavior, which according to them has a very, very important impact upon the situation and the function of your body. And at the same time, the way that you think and it comes to the theology of the issue of medicine, and that goes to the ideology of healing, prayers for healing, contribution towards healing, uh, and, and the rest of the theological issues which has to do with your physical well-being. I'm saying that because when we look at this tablet of medicine, we see that Baha'u'llah is talking about fundamental issues in behavior and in ethics and in morality. At the same time, he gives some advice on nutrition, on medicine, and also it goes to the question of theological approach towards medical welfare. Therefore, the tablet of medicine is not narrowly written on the question of medical sciences as we understand it today. It's much more than that. Regarding the tablet of medicine, for the English-speaking people here, we have a very, very brief explanation of this issue and the revelation of the tablet written by Mr. Adib Taherzadeh in his Revelation of Baha'u'llah, Volume 3, where he speaks about the life of Baha'u'llah and Akka, and he speaks about the revelation of the Kitab Aghdas, and in discussing the Kitab Aghdas, 
Mr. Tarzadeh comes to the question of tablet of medicine, which is in fact a kind of elaboration on the verses of the Aqdas which has to do with medicine. One of the basic verse in the Kitab Aqdas, it says in the Kitab Aqdas that when you are sick and ill, go and find a competent, well-educated, experienced physician. And this verse in the Kitab Aqdas has led Mr. Tarzadeh to talk about the question of medicine and also a little bit about the life of Muhammad Reza, who is the recipient. One thing which is very interesting for me, at least as a historian of the Baha'i faith, is that I do not have that much information about this Muhammad Reza Tabib. Biographical information. He apparently has been a very, very, very close friend of Haj Muhammad Tahir Malamiri, the father of Adib and Habib. And the information that we have had about the life of the recipient of this tablet comes from Muhammad Tahir, the father of Tahir Zadis, who has been in Yazd and who has been in close relationship with this man. And what Muhammad Tahir Malamiri has written about this man, although it's short, and you can see it in the third volume of the Revelation of Baha'u'llah, is very brief. But Muhammad Tahir Malamiri is absolutely fascinated by the character, by the generosity, by the good temper, by the kindness of this man, which with, with huge spiritual capacity, that everybody in the community of the Baha'is of Yaz would go to him. He was so kind and generous and understanding that he would cure his patient. Not necessarily by going to a very long list of do's and don'ts and this and that and this after supper and this before supper and this for your breakfast and so on and so forth, but with a simple elementary treatment of using or asking him to use some herbs to cut some of his unnecessary behavior or to come with terms with some of the psychological, emotional problems in order to get rid of the physical illness. This is the kind of man. And apparently, his entire trust for the question of healing was put on the divine confirmation that I am prescribing to you to use this herb or this kind of tea or this kind of fruits and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I'm asking the supreme healer to help me to transit that power through me as a physician to you for the cure of your physical problem. This is the kind of man that his full trust is in the divine power of healing and he sees himself as an instrument, as a channel to transfer that power to his patient. And this is in fact what Baha'u'llah asks the Baha'i physicians to do when you are facing a sick person in front of you, first close your eyes, ask the divine confirmation that, oh God, help me and make me an instrument to help this sick person. We don't know what is the effect of that, but this is what the Baha'i physicians have been asked to practice. It means do not rely on your academic education and academic journals and papers and so on and so forth wholeheartedly. This is the point. You, of course, are familiar with the sources. You, are, you have finished your school. You have spent 
years of your life in the medical school, so forth and so on. But at the same time, don't forget that you are not the healer and the healing power has to come from somewhere else and you are besieging that your science, your techniques, your experience is utilized to transfer that power to the sick person. What is very important in this tablet and is really amazing is that Baha'u'llah has called the science of medicine as the noblest science that human being has ever been able to develop. And in the eyes of the Baha'is, the noblest jobs that are available to the humanity is the job of a physician. I don't want to go into all the details, but my feeling is that the younger generation of the Baha'is, as a result of this advice of Baha'u'llah, are very, very highly encouraged to go to medical sciences, particularly mental sciences, and to see how the medical schools and medicine and medical sciences could be approved, could be developed and nourished and come to maturity as a result of the Baha'i inspiration that a Baha'i physician can get from these writings and put into practice by the help of medical sciences that we learn in the medical schools around the world. So, if you would like to serve the faith, if you would like to be the cure for the millions of sick people around the world, if you would like to improve the situation of medical sciences, you as a young Baha'is are encouraged if you have possibility, ability, interest, money, paying the tuition, going through examinations, and so on and so forth, please consider going to medical sciences and right medical sciences. Divine medical sciences is the one that is very badly needed in the world. The tablet of medicine, of course, This is my own cup from yesterday. <laughs> Medically, is not good for me. So. I need a drop. Oh, thank you so much. It was easier than I thought. So. When we talk about the question of medicine and the tablet of medicine, now I would like to come to this point, that during the time of Baha'u'llah, after this tablet of medicine in early Akko period, he of course wrote many other tablets. In some of them, you have some more or detailed advices on the question of medicine. But during the time of Abdul Baha, we see a very important enrichment of the literature on medicine in his writings and also in his daily life. And because for roughly two decades that he was sitting and working with the physicians around him in the city of Akka, he became very much interested. I'm, I'm referring to Dr. Yunus Khan and Dr. Habib Mayyad. These are two physicians being with Abdul Ba in, in about 20 years. Therefore, many, many Baha'is and many, many discussions that Abdul Ba had with the friends in Akka at the presence of Yunus Khan and Habib Mayyad two graduates from the Medical School of American University of Beirut, 
Therefore, we have a lot of talks, table talks, and notes, and pilgrim notes on the question of medicine during the time of Abdul Baha. And at the same time, Many frequent questions that were raised by the believers, particularly in the East, had to do with my weak eyes, had to do with my poor health, had to do with the sectogeny, miscarriage had to do with many, many medical aspects that the believers find the master to answer these kind of questions. So the, right, my, my, the point is that the, the writings of Abdul Baha from 1892 all the way to 1921 is a very, very rich source material for medical issues. At the same time, there are many talks and pilgrim notes in the writings of Yunus Khan, in the writings of Habib Mayad, in the writings of Badi Bushui, that they have narrated that Abdul Baha had a piece of bread and some olives, and he said that this is really sufficient for my lunch. So they came to this conclusion that the simple, good quality bread and a few olives was the lunch of Abdul Baha, and he was very happy, and he advised, in fact, to have a simple lunch such as, on, uh, such as olives and bread, and therefore it's good for you if you be satisfied with these two items as your lunch. Keeps you going. However, the Guardian, the House of Justice, has told us that we do not rely on the pilgrim notes. We go with the writings of Abdul Baha, but we don't care what he said orally to the friends. Those are not binding us. We read whatever the pilgrims have written about what they heard, what they are here saying. See what is the point? It doesn't have any binding authority upon our judgment or life. The question of medical issues, of course, were raised during the time of the Guardian. And probably, I really don't know, but probably we have few dozens of letters of Shoghi Effendi which goes to the medical issues and the questions that the Baha'is have raised and they receive answers from the Guardian. And the questions of medical issues, of course, have been raised during the time of the Universal House of Justice. On the question of abortion, on the question of fertility from one who is not the husband of the man. Donation of the organs, for example. Mercy killing. These are medical issues that have been raised during the time of the guardian, at the same time during the time of the Universal House of Justice. And there are many, many, many answers towards this kind of so-called medical questions in the writings of Shoghi Effendi and in the writings of the Universal House of Justice. So, back to the tablet of medicine. Tablet of medicine is available in the English language and has been available in the English language in summary form and then in full form <clears throat> since 1922. I think for the first time, Dr. Zia Baghdadi, who was a physician and was in charge of the Star of the West, as the editor of the Star of the West, he published for the first time the summary of the main issues of this tablet in the Star of the West of December 1922. So if you are interested in seeing the abridgment of this tablet, you go to December issue of 1922 of the Star of the West, and you will see the text is there. Then, of course, is 
translated and retranslated, and one of the final version of the English translation of this tablet of medicine is found in bahailibrary.org. And if you go there and type tablet of medicine, you will have the text of the tablet in the English translation. For the sake of the Persian, I, I don't need to say this because I'm going to speak about the same issue next time, next hour. So, uh, anyhow, the, the original Arabic text is also available in the collection of the writings of Abdul. For medical issues in general, I mean more than this tablet, we have a very important compilation called Health and Healing, which is a very important and very rich compilation of the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and the Guardian and the House of Justice, and that has been published, called Health and Healing, and is also published separately and is published in compilation of compilations. Mm -hmm. This is two volumes, and in, I think in volume one, you have this compilation reprinted in this book. So if you go to the compilation of compilations, there is a chapter in which you will find the compilation on the question of health and healing and all the major writings of the central figures of the faith and the House of Justice is found there. More than this, more than the text of the Tablet of Medicine and this compilation of the writings, I would like to suggest that you go to a very, very rich and detailed chapter of Helen Hornby called The Lights of Guide. In her book called The Lights of Guidance, and you can find it right away in your telephone or by going to the internet, she has devoted a very important and rather long chapter to the question of health and healing. Mental health, exercises, nutrition, modern practices, and all the related issues to this question of health and healing is dealt with by Helen Hornby in her Lights of Guidance. So, friends, what did I tell you? I told you about the tablet, the revelation, the date, the recipient, and the translation, and the other sources related to the question of healing in the compilation and in the lights of guidance by Helen Horn. Now I think it's time to look into the content of this tablet. As a kind of introduction to this topic of the content of this tablet, I would like to say that for Baha'u'llah, the most important thing and the pivotal point in his thinking about the question of medicine is to go to an experienced physician. Don't care about your own judgment. Don't care about the advice of your sister. And of course, you don't care about the advice of your mother-in-law. So that is. <laughs> we don't care about the mother-in-law. But Uncle John or Auntie Maria, whatever they have told you, forget about it. And if you are sick, this is the order of Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Aqdas and in this tablet that you seek the advice of an experienced, educated, skilled physician for your problems. Therefore, by no means I'm suggesting that the tablet of medicine is 
a prescription for well-being for any disease that you have. There is no such a thing. What he has given us in this tablet, there are definitely some medical advices. Then he goes to some moral advices, which has a great impact upon the physical situation and health. And then it goes to the question of common sense. Common sense. That if you had, a, for example, a big meal at lunch, try to have a lighter meal for some. I think this is a kind of common sense. Everybody understands that the big breakfast doesn't require you to have a big lunch. And if you are going to do that once in a while, probably is all right. But if it's a matter of practice, you are crossing the border of doing justice to your stomach. You are overloading it. You are making it to a level that is not bearable for the human digestion system. Therefore, the tablet of medicine is important for his advice, for his nutritional, for his physical, and also for the moral impact our judgment and behavior upon our health. Therefore, is, is important, but Baha'u'llah has not narrowed it down to just medis, medical and medicine. So this is, this is the whole point. The tablet of Baha'u'llah it starts with this wonderful sentence and we have to be thankful to him that he says that this tablet is revealed for your general guidance at the absence of an expert physician. So it means that if you have access to a skilled physician for your problem, go to him and neglect this piece of work of mine, this tablet. That is the source of cure. That is the source for consultation. That is the source for advice. That is the man or the authority that has to be followed and not what I have written in this tablet. At the same time, why Baha'u'llah is writing this and, in a sense, disqualifying the advices and the prescription that he has given? Simply because, as a manifestation of God, he is concerned about human being. And human being is a combination of material essence and the spiritual life. And therefore, from the hidden words, early, middle, Baghdad period, all the way to the end of his life, we have hundreds of tablets regarding the development of the spirit, morality, spiritual capacity, and so on and so forth. Then he decided to write this because of the nobility of the body of man at the same time. We are a spiritual people, and we war for a spirituality, and we are not going to have anything to do with this material body when we go to the next world. However, while we are here in this material realm, we have to respect these material eyes, this tongue, his stomach and our knees and fingers. You see the point? So, in a sense, this body is important, is precious, we have to take care of it. 
we have to be careful about his welfare. At the same time, we have to know that this is just an instrument to have the spirit in it, or is a seat for the spirit. And the final analysis of our life is the spiritual life and not our body life and material life and material body. At the beginning of this tablet, he says, don't eat ever if you are not hungry. So if you are hungry, it means that your body is ready to receive food. But if you don't feel that you are hungry, but there is an inviting piece of cheesecake here. <laughs> but if you don't feel hungry, don't, don't touch it. So it means that the first, the first sentence of the tablet has to do with listen to your body. If you are really hungry and you are dying for something to eat, eat it. Otherwise, don't go because it's free. <laughs> and don't go because it's cheap. And don't go if you don't, <laughs> all you can eat, yes. And if you, for any other reasons. So, the point is that grabbing a piece of food and eating has to do with this hungriness. If you're hungry and your body is in need, you go for food. The second one is the question of water while you're going to bed or while you're sleeping and you feel that you're thirsty, you have to go and have a cup of water or something. This is not advised by Baha'u'llah, that when we are asleep, we are not supposed to drink anything. This comes, I think, directly from Avicenna in his canon. Exactly the same wording I think Baha'u'llah has used. I don't know if Baha'u'llah was familiar with the canon of Ave, of the canon in medicine of Avicenna or not, but Avicenna, this is an advice that he has, he has also given to his, to his patient. That drinking water during the night time when you are sleeping is not good for your body. The other thing that is in this tablet, never exercise with an empty stomach. As I mentioned, many of you are not surprised by these advices because these are now common sense. And it comes probably naturally, particularly in the West. We are told that when we are having heavy exercises, and a lot of walking or something physically, we are not supposed to have it with a full stomach. So exercise is useful, is effective when the stomach is not full of food. Then he is advising us that if you have a pain, go for it. Go and take care of it. Do not be lazy. Do not neglect it. Do not prolong the problem. Therefore, this is his advice. And apparently, this is also common sense, that you can stop the pain or the problem at the earliest stage. If it is prolonged already, is good is not good for you, is not good for your physician to deal with it if you have come, for example, three weeks earlier. You see what is the point? So if you feel that you have a pain, you have a problem, there is something wrong, and so on and so forth, try to find a solution, have a consultation as soon as it is possible. Again, Probably none of us is surprised by, by this advice of Baha'u'llah, which is, it comes from the common sense. However, 
you are prosperous to live in the United States of America. A tremendous amount of possibilities and so on. But there are millions and millions of people who are deprived of this kind of facilities and they are deprived of their daily bread even. Leave alone sophisticated operation and sophisticated food program and so on and so forth. Anyhow, he is talking here at the, another point, at the beginning of the tablet, that if your previous meal has not been fully digested, do not try to have another meal. So it means that we have to let the stomach and the digestion system to work and get rid of what has been eaten already and then go for another course of eating as soon as the stomach is fully digested. So, then another issue that is very important here and this is very common, probably among the younger people, do not swallow your food unless it is fully chewed. Holof, holof, nachor. This is what He's trying to say in a very, <laughs> in a very polite way. Baha'u'llah was polite after all. Khaila. <laughs> One of the basic, these are all nutrition issues. Advice of Baha'u'llah here is that try to Cure your problem first with food and then to go to medicine. Therefore, medicine is not your first choice. And nowadays, I think I'm not a physician again, and I ask the forgiveness of, of the physicians here. But what Baha'u'llah is saying, in fact, is that many, many problems, many medical issues can be resolved by food, water, fruits, nuts, different kinds of teas, and so on and so forth. So if it is possible, try to use this kind of food and drinks and so on, and if they are not effective, then you go to the medicine. And here medicine is vis-a-vis -vis natural remedies rather than artificial medicine that is produced by pharmacological companies. And they would like to sell it. Baha'u'llah's other advice is that if you are finished with your pain, with your problem, don't continue with medicine. As soon as medicine has done its job, you are finished with that, you stop taking the medicine, go back to your normal life. So we are not supposed to take medicine while we are all right. There is a statement here Baha'u'llah speaks about Zedan. If foods of opposing, if foods of opposing dispositions are available at table, do not mix them. 
This is a very, very fundamental issue of Zedon. In the old school of medicine, in Avicenna particularly, they believe that foods sometimes are not in harmony with each other. And each food has a certain conditions or constitutions that do not go with the other one. Okay? So if you have, for example, it's just an example. I don't know if it's scientifically or right or not. But if you have, for example, yogurt, which is cold by its con constitution, and you have fish or honey, which is warm in its constitutions, in its mesage. Do not mix them. And the word that Baha'u'llah has used in this sentence is zedon, means opposite natures, working against each other. Therefore, now this is a call, in fact, to all the nutritionists and food scientists to see what is the constitutions of the food that are available to human beings. And which one is against the other one, which one is in harmony with the other one, and to find out the list of Zedon. And come up with some suggestions that if these and these are available at the table, they are not supposed to go together. Again, Baha'u'llah says, this is fascinating. If foods of opposing disposition are available at the table, do not mix them. Another emphasize that Baha'u'llah is making, and I think to some extent in the Western civilization is very common, he says it starts with raqiq, it starts with liquid food, and then go to solid food. It means it starts with soup, for example, then go to a more solid cello kebab. The American friends are familiar with these two terms, yes? You have been receiving the hospitality of the Persian friends who make cello kebab for you. Salat. So this is another advice. You start your food, you start your meal with soup, with something liquid, and then go to solid food. Baha'u'llah speaks here about morality. And this question of morality is very important in this particular work. According to Avicenna and according to Baha'u'llah here, says don't go to extreme. Be happy with simpler food. Don't make it sophisticated. Qinaat. Qinaat means be satisfied, be happy with something smaller, something simpler, and not go into elaborated, lavish kind of table with different kinds of things and you fill up yourself with many things, and then you feel that you're tired, you're sleepy, you have a stomach ache, and the other consequences. So the question of qinaat means to be satisfied with simpler things is one of his advices. The other thing that is very, very common among the Muslims and in Islamic civilization, 
and we are also fortunate to have this verse in this tablet, is to start your food with remembering God and saying, Ya Baha Al-Abha, and then approach the table. Mentioning God or in Islam, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, then you sit down at the sofre, at the, at the table. This is what he advises us. And to end the food by Alhamdulillah, Shukr Ilahi, we praise God that we have been given this food or I have had my meal today. So, therefore, from this verse of the kitab, of, the, of this tablet, we can come to this conclusion that this eating is not just physical, animalistic approach towards human life, but it has to start with the praise of God and ends with the thanking God for giving us this food, helping us to digest, help us to cure our problems, and so on and so forth. So the food and this material body, therefore, goes hand in hand with the question of a spirituality and a spiritual approach towards food rather than taking it as kind of material means. We are in the Baha'i faith are very lucky that several Prayers of Abdul Ba have been written for the beginning of the meal and for ending the meal. Probably you don't have time. Many of us do not have time to sit down on the table and say the prayer that Abdul Ba wrote before the meal and the prayers that he revealed, in fact, for after the meal. But friends, whenever it's possible, start your meal with prayer and end the meal with prayers. Particularly those prayers that Abdul Ba wrote for this particular event. Starting the meal and ending the meal. Baha'u'llah says, do that. Do this. Then one of his advice, which I have not been doing recently, but is very, very important, in fact, is a few meters, inches, feet of walking after meal. So do not have your meal and lay down on the couch or go to bed. So he's talking about Amshe Qalil, Mashiya Qalil. Mashiya Qalil means few steps of walking, if it is possible, to let the food settle in your stomach, and then, of course, you can sit and rest or go to sleep and so on and so forth. But he is giving us this advice, this physical advice, that we are supposed to walk a few steps after meal. I'm wondering if the nutritionists around here are in harmony with Baha'u'llah or they have something against this advice. Naturally, natural. Very good. Baha'u'llah says whatever is difficult to chew upon is not good for you. So God has given you a jaw and teeth and you can taste if something is really hard hard to be chewed, it means that it's difficult to digest when it goes down to your stomach. So as soon as you see that a piece of meat is difficult to chew upon, you have to neglect it, forget it, and go for a cooked piece of meat. A raw meat which is difficult to chew upon is not good for the digestion of your stomach. Then Baha'u'llah says, <clears throat> do not forget breakfast. 
And the breakfast is the lamp to enlighten your day and your life. So, many, many of us are busy and living in the West, in the serial country, going to work. We just grab Red Bull, <laughs> rush to the car, <laughs> and go. A cup of coffee, jumping to the car, and going. This is not the way of a healthy life. We have to, Paula says, doesn't say what we are supposed to eat, but definitely some fruits, some nuts, a piece of bread, small sandwich, something that's given to the stomach in early morning after waking up is the lamp that enlightened your body for the entire day. So if you are not having breakfast, it doesn't mean to be a very full breakfast of eggs and scrambled eggs and, and the rest of it. That is all right, provided that something you have eaten. The other issue is very important, and it comes to morality. Friends, we need some of you who are experts in medical sciences to work on this statement of Baha'u'llah, which is absolutely fascinating. Anxiety and depression are twin They are, this depression and anxiety, and also, yes, here is the continuation of that, as envy and anger will burn at the liver. So we are talking about these four things. One is Ham, anxiety, depression, envy, and anger. Rat, raise in the Arabic language. Burn at the liver. It means has a great taxation, these moral issues, has a great taxation upon the healthy body. We are not supposed, friends, to be jealous. We are supposed to flee from whatever makes us depressed. Go to music, according to the Kitab Abbas. If a certain composer or certain kind of music make you depressed, go to another kind. is very, very, very important that we avoid depression and avoid to be envy of someone, some position, some money. He has this, I don't have that, and so on and so forth. This kind of thinking, this kind of lack of morality in this sense affects the body, according to the text of Baha'u'llah here. And the words that he has used is ham vagam, anxiety and depression. And then he says envy, hasad, and reiz means anger. So if something angers you, if you are having a conversation and it's getting to a hot point and you're going to get angry, put on a stop, change the subject, change the environment, and so on and so forth. So we have to be very much concerned about these four moral elements which burns our liver, according to the text. Burns your liver. Okay, 
anxiety, depression, envy, and anger. Then Baha'u'llah is speaking about a question that is very, very nicely expressed in the Kitab Aghdas, and that is purification of the bowels. And purification of the bowels in the suitable season that is prescribed in this tablet has to do with fasting. And unlike Islam, fasting in the Baha'i faith is fixed in a right season. Beginning of spring, the end of, summer, the end of winter. And this is the perfect time for the purification of the bowels. When we leave the bowels for 12 hours per day for fasting and is not working, these should be repeated. So if you are wondering about the reason and the wisdom behind fasting, here he's, he's explaining that once a while, now in the Baha'i faith, 19 days per year, we fast and let our bowels to be purified at least for half a day, 12 hours out of 24 hours. And this is done not in the cold of the winter, not in the heat of the summer, but is in the springtime, which is the most effective time of the year for the purification of the bowel. Then Baha'u'llah says, do not Exaggerate. Do not go into extreme in your food. And friends, if you want me to tell you what is the essence of this tablet altogether, I tell you that this is an invitation to a balanced, moderate style of life. Exaggeration in any sense is not good. And what we are looking for, and Avicenna is talking tremendously about this issue, is that we have to have a etedal. A etedal. Moderation. 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 If we go into extreme, then this four constitutions of our body will change. And that means illness. And the work of the physician is to bring the balance of those elements all together. And that is why the physicians in Islamic civilizations are called Hakim. Hakim means the man who knows where is the balance in your body and what is out of balance, what has gone into extreme, and what is going to bring this extreme into its normal level. So health means balance, means moderation, and sickness means going into extreme. Five minutes. Are you pulling my leg or? <laughs> Friends, this is not a tablet that within 45 minutes, 70 minutes, I don't know how much time I had, to fully cover it and, and, and go into all the details what he has said. But the point that I would like to mention and jump to the end of it is the advises that Baha'u'llah is giving to the physicians. Friends, if you are a physician or if you are going to a medical school, according to this tablet, be aware that you are putting a great, heavy responsibility upon your shoulder. You are getting to the noblest job in the world, 
you are learning the noblest sciences in the world, but at the same time, you have to be aware that you are in charge of the life of your human friends. And therefore, he says, The Baha'i physicians have to always seek the guidance of the great healer to be assisted to treat the sick. And also he says, meeting, seeing a physician who has been drunk by the wine of the love of God by itself is a cure. So this is the importance of medicine and this is the importance of medical professionals in the Baha'i faith that your love for Baha'u'llah and the burning of his life, burning of the love of Baha'u'llah in your own self is transmitted to put your patient into fire of this love. And this fire is too going to be purified the illness of your subject. Okay. I'm not worried about the rest of the tablet. There is no time for that. But I am delighted to let you know that one of the most probably important and the shortest tablet or prayer for healing is revealed within this tablet. And the guardian translated that prayer for healing himself. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God. And remembrance of thee is my remedy. You're familiar with this, with this prayer. And the whole point is that we have on the one hand all the advices and physical issues and physical advice that Baha'u'llah has given us, but at the same time, we have been fortunate to have more than a dozen of tablets and prayers dealing with the question of healing. And definitely, if these tablets, these prayers, were not going to be effective, neither Baha'u'llah nor Abdul Baha would have sat to write them. Therefore, for ourselves, for our friends, for the healing of the humanity, all the sick people, and also for the divine confirmation upon our physicians is important that we use these tablets for healing. The final point which is fascinating. Baha'u'llah says, whatever I have asked for myself, I have asked for you, my followers. And then, towards the end, he goes to the question of hikmat va bayan, the question of wisdom and a statement. The first is wisdom and utterance, and then he goes to the steadfastness in the covenant of God. I don't know how to relate these two qualities with the question of medicine. But definitely we are talking about the interrelationship between service, helping the faith, teaching the faith, 
united in the faith and what our body goes through in our daily life. God bless you and have a wonderful, healthy, happy life with the tremendous opportunity that you have had in this land for teaching the faith and for being steadfast in his covenant. Thank you.